Good afternoon and good morning to our friends on the West Coast. I'm Neelam Chowdhury, the Executive Director of Global Learning Programs at the Center for Global, Global Education at Asia Society. We are so pleased to have you join us for the first reading of our Own Voices Virtual Reading Room. Each month, we will feature children's stories that highlight the Asian and Asian American experience by authors who tell these important stories through their own voices. Before I introduce you to our featured author today, I'd like to take a moment to thank our partner, The Culture Tree. The Culture Tree promotes cultural literacy about South Asia through language and education programs. Their goal is to create empathy, respect, and understanding toward a variety of cultures. We are pleased to have its founder, Anu Segal, with us today, who will mo moderate the question and answer portion of the program. Now, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our featured author, Simranjit Singh. He is the author of Fauja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. The first from a major publisher to a feature, a Sikh story. Simran is a writer, teacher, scholar, and an activist. He loves sports and signed up for his first marathon after being inspired by Fauja Singh. And like Fauja, he hasn't stopped running since. Simran was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, into a Sikh family and now lives in New York, with his wife and two daughters. After today's reading, we will be taking questions from our audience. Please post them in the comment section, either on Facebook or on YouTube, and we will try to get to as many as possible. Simran, we are very excited to have you join us today. Please take it away. Thank you, Neelam, and thank you everyone for being here. It's nice to see you all. Um, I will show you the, the book that we'll be reading today, which is called Foja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. Um, but before I actually read it, I, I wanted to share with you all the reason why I decided to write this story, because it's really special to me. And it's something that I've really thought about a lot when I was growing up. So I'll start by telling you that when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in Texas, in San Antonio. And here's a picture of my family when we were growing up. Uh, my parents, you see them, uh, my mom, my dad, and I have three brothers. I'm the one sitting in my dad's lap, uh, the one with the funny smile. I guess we all have funny smiles. Um, and you can see the four boys, my brothers and me, are all wearing small turbans called patkas. And my dad is wearing a larger turban called a pagari. Now, this is part of our cultural and religious heritage. Uh, we started wearing these turbans when we were kids. Uh, we have long hair underneath them. You can see on top, there are little buns uh, on top of our heads. That's our hair tied up in a little knot. Um, and so you could probably guess that we looked really different from the people around us growing up, right? With our turbans, uh, you can see my mom is wearing a traditional Punjabi suit. Uh, my parents moved here to the United States uh, from Punjab, India, uh, they moved here uh, before I was even born. And they settled in Texas, in South Texas, and we were the only family uh, in the entire area who wore turbans. And so, like I was saying, we looked really different. And part of what I would think about when I was a kid was, I really wish that I could find books or TV shows or movies that had characters that looked like the people in my family, the people that I loved. But every time I would go to the bookstore or the library or watch TV, I just could never find anything like that. And I would be so disappointed. I would always look, I'd always want it, and I'd be so disappointed. And I even remember asking my school librarian once, I asked her, is, is there a book that you know of for kids that has characters like the people in my family? people from Punjab, people from Sikh backgrounds. And the librarian said, you know what? I don't know of any. And I think it's because it's not relatable. People just wouldn't understand. And I was about, about the age that you see me in this picture here. Um, and, and when she told me that, and I was so disappointed and so hurt because while she didn't, she wasn't trying to be mean, what I felt was she, she thought that no one cared about people who looked like me that our stories didn't matter to them. And so I decided at about this age uh, that when I grew up, if those books didn't exist, that I would wanna write them myself. And 
So one funny thing happened that happens to people in life. Uh, I did grow up. Here's a picture of, of my family now. Um, and, and this is me with my two daughters. And right before the first daughter was born, I asked her, I asked my wife, what books should we get for our kids? And we started going to bookstores and libraries trying to understand uh, what are the best books for kids. And I realized that although there were new books, there still weren't any with people who look like the people in my family. And I felt disappointed again and I felt sad again. And I remembered my promise to myself. I had told myself when I grew up, if these books didn't exist, I would write them myself. And so I decided that it was time to write the book, but there was still one problem. And that is you can't just sit down and write a book without a good story. You have to think of good ideas. And so I started thinking and thinking and I kept trying to think of ideas and I couldn't come up with any. And then just six weeks after my older daughter was born, my favorite runner in the whole world was coming to where I live now in New York City. And he was coming to be a celebrity guest for a race. And I wanted to go meet him. I wanted him to meet my daughter. He was really famous because as you might've guessed, he was the oldest person to ever run a marathon. So I went to go meet him. I took my baby girl with me and we sat together for two hours just talking about life. I learned everything I could about life from him. He had so many interesting stories and he had such good ideas about what it means to live a long and happy life. And it was while I was talking to him, while he was holding my, my daughter, who was more than, he was more than 100 years older than her, actually, when he was holding her. Uh, and while he was holding her, I was thinking, this is the story that I want to tell the world because it has changed my life and there are so many good lessons for it. So that's how I decided to write this story. And now I'm excited to share it with you. So the story, again, is called Foja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. So I'm going to show it to you on my screen because the illustrations are incredible and I want you to get to see them as well as you can. So I have it pulled up for you here and I'm going to move down into the story. <clears throat> it was a sweltering summer. Little Foja Singh sat under the shade of a banyan tree in his village in Punjab, eating mangoes and watching the other children play. Foja was smart and funny. He and his friends liked to play cards and marbles while sitting in a circle and telling jokes. But Foja longed to join them when they ran and jumped. He longed to play hopscotch, to rescue a runaway cricket ball, or to run with a kite flying high across the sky. He wished he felt as strong as his name, which meant warrior lion. When he was very little, his parents worried that he might never walk. Month after month and year after year went by, but Foja did not take a single step. Aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas shook their heads gravely and said, it's too hard, he's too weak. But Foja did not listen and Foja did not stop. Instead, every morning he would listen to his mother who said, you know yourself, Foja, and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. Foja practiced walking outside his family's hut each day, staying in the mud to soften every fall. He practiced and prayed for months. He could feel himself getting stronger inside and out. And then a few days after Foja's fifth birthday, a wonderful thing happened. He took one step and another, then another and another and another. Foja Singh was finally walking. Foja's parents were proud that their son understood what he was capable of and that he worked hard to achieve his goals. They were thrilled Foja could walk because they knew it would make his life easier. His parents were so happy, they shared prayers of thanks and distributed prashad to the entire village. Once Foja began to walk, his legs needed strengthening. 
he practiced walking around the banyan tree every day. Some bullies thought his legs looked like sticks, and they teased Foja by calling him Danda. But Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. Though his legs were weak, Foja's spirit was strong. As Foja got bigger, it was time to go to school. But the school was miles away from his small village. There were no buses. Foja's legs couldn't carry him all that distance, and they couldn't bring the school to him. So while Foja's friends went to school, he got his education on the farm, learning to plant, plow, and pick all kinds of crops. It's too hard. He's too weak, said the neighbors. But Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. He'd walk behind the buffaloes, planting seeds and getting stronger with each step. Foja worked and worked and worked. He walked and walked and walked. He farmed and farmed and farmed. And when Foja turned 15, the whole village witnessed a new wonder. Foja could walk an entire mile. Foja progressed by leaps and bounds, and he took many big steps over the next few years. He got married, he had children, and he even got, got his own farm. Foja loved life in Punjab. He loved flying kites in the open fields with his children. He loved the excitement of a close cricket match played with friends. And he loved the joy that filled the village during the harvest festival of Visakhi. He taught his children how to farm just like his father had taught him. Every morning, he would tell his children, you know yourselves and what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. He cherished every step in his life's journey. As time passed, Foja's children grew up and moved to places far away. Foja, who was usually lively and energetic, grew sad and lonely especially after his wife died. He missed his family and wanted to be with them. But to leave his village at the age of 81, to go live on the other side of the world, could Foja do it? His friends were worried. You're too old, Foja, they said. It's too hard for you to move away. But Foja didn't listen and Foja didn't stop. He knew it was time for him to take a step in a new direction. One day, Foja got on an airplane for the first time and went to live with his family in England. It was cold in England, and almost everyone only spoke English. Foja was used to having many friends, but here he felt like a stranger. His family was busy with school and work. Foja found himself with nowhere to go and nothing to do. Foja passed his days in the living room, staring at the television. He had never been so miserable. As he was flipping channels one day, he saw something new. A whole lot of people were running around town. Was it a fire? An accident? No, Foja realized. They were running just to run, and they all had big smiles on their faces. Foja knew at once that he had to try this. He put on his shoes, then walked out the door. He took one step, and another, then another, and another, and another. Foja Singh was running. The wind flowed through his beard, and for the first time in a long while, a smile appeared on his face. After that day, there was no stopping Foja. He began by running a little bit every morning. As he got stronger, he ran faster and longer. And when he felt especially strong, he would even run again in the evenings before eating dal and roti with his family. In England, it was common to see people running for fun, but not many of them looked like Foja Singh. Some people would stare and some would laugh but Foja did not let that bother him. He ran and ran through the streets and parks of England, getting better and better each day. He ran races and he ran for fun. He ran with his friends and he ran alone, always with a smile on his face. 
Foja loved running. He liked the new friends he made. He enjoyed exploring the new country he now called home. And he loved how being outdoors reminded him of his childhood, of playing hopscotch and flying kites in the fields. It had been a long time since he felt this happy. More than anything, Foja loved the challenge. He had always enjoyed pushing his limits, whether it was learning to walk, doing farm work, or moving to a new country. Now he was ready for his next challenge. He started training with a coach, Harmander Singh, who had run many marathons and had trained others to run marathons too. There was no looking back after that. Harmander and Foja ran together many times a week. And after months of hard work, 89-year-old Foja Singh became one of the oldest people to ever complete the 26.2-mile London Marathon. Foja ran the London Marathon five more times after that, getting faster each year and setting new records each time. By this point, Foja was famous, as people in England followed this man with a beard, turban, and disarming smile running great distances, they began to learn more about his sick background. Around this time, Foja learned that some people in the United States were attacking Sikhs for how they looked. Foja knew this was wrong and he wanted to help, but he wasn't sure how to share his message. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he couldn't speak English, but he could run. And at once, Foja knew what he had to do. He decided to run the world's biggest marathon in New York City. By now, Foja was 93 years old. Could he still run 26.2 miles? Many news reporters didn't think so. But Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. Every day, he practiced with his coach. Every night, he dreamed about running. And every morning, he reminded himself of his mother's words. You know yourself, Foja, and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. The big race finally came on a chilly November day in 2003. Foja Singh stood at the start line. He felt ready, knowing he had prepared as well as he could. He stretched in anticipation and recited a prayer, envisioning what it would feel like to cross the finish line. Just then, Someone shouted racist and hateful words at him. Other people joined in. Foja brushed it off. He knew he had a strong spirit. He ran one foot in front of the other, and then disaster. The tender blisters on the soles of his feet had burst, and he was in a world of pain. He kept going, limping to the finish line, and he made it, but it was his slowest time ever. Foja was so exhausted that he collapsed right after the race. Medics wanted to rush him into an ambulance and take him away to recover. But Foja preferred to stay and recover in the company of his trainer and fellow runners. Foja made it back to England. And for the first time in a long while, he was sad. Foja had wanted to run fast and show the world what six could achieve. But he felt like his poor performance at the world's biggest marathon made him look weak and that he had failed his six siblings all over the world. Maybe they were right, said a voice in his mind. Maybe it is too hard. Maybe you are too weak. The voice made Foja doubt himself for the first time in years and it tried to convince him to quit running altogether. But Foja did not listen. Inspired by his coach, he set a new goal for himself he was going to be the first 100-year-old person to ever run a full marathon. Foja ran every single day for years. He ran and ran. He practiced and practiced. He trained and trained. And when the day came, he knew he was ready. On October 16, 2011, 100-year-old Foja Singh lined up at the start for the Toronto Waterfront Marathon. He was so excited that it felt like an electric current was flowing through his body. He ran along the course 
and people joined him for a few miles at a time to show their support. He welcomed them with a smile, offering jokes to adults and high fives to children. As he ran, Foja thought about all the things people had said he would never do. They said he couldn't walk, but he did. They said he couldn't farm, but he did. They thought he was too old to run. And yet here he was, running 26.2 miles at the age of 100. Foja had never been more sure of himself. He hoped that children and adults everywhere would see him take on this difficult challenge and persevere with grace, something he learned through his faith. It took him just over eight hours, but he finally did it. Foja Singh finished the Toronto Marathon and set a new world record as the oldest person to ever run a marathon. He stood tall and smiled proudly, holding tightly to his medal. He had faced many challenges in his 100 years, but Foja Singh always kept going. So that's the end of the story. And I will just show you one more page where it has a real photo of Foja Singh. Uh, some more information about his life and also a list of all his records, his national records uh, and his world records. So I will stop sharing my screen now and come back to you. Thank you so much, Simran. Um, so at this point, uh, we, are, we are taking Q and A's. Um, so please keep submitting your questions. I have a few questions already. Simran, every time I hear this book or see this book being read, um, you know, it's a new experience for me. And I have to say it has become our coffee table book, as you know, my, my mother loves reading it. My kids and they're different ages, they love reading it. So I think there is a takeaway and I love reading it. Um, there's a takeaway for different age groups in this book. Um, so the first question that was submitted, um, Simran, is for running a marathon, what is more important, a strong mind or a strong body? And this question was actually submitted by Matt, who is eight years old. So Simran, if you can just start off by telling us um, what your experience is. Sure, yeah, great question, Matt. And I would say it's hard to say which one is more important because both of those are, are really, really important. And. Um, I actually, as, as, we, as we mentioned when I, we started this session, uh, I actually started running marathons because of Foja Singh. Uh, when I first heard his story, I was so inspired. And so I've run several marathons now. And I have to say that in training for them, when you practice every day, uh, you have to practice exercising your body, right? Running, uh, making sure you're uh, lifting weights, all, all the things that are part of the training, but also you have to make sure your mind is strong enough because no matter how much you practice, uh, there always gets to be a point in the race where you feel tired and you want to give up and you have to tell yourself your mind has to be strong enough. You have to train your mind to be ready to say, no giving up. You're going to keep going. You're going to keep trying. And so that's, that's my own lesson. I'll also say that I learned from Floyd Jessing and he talks about this in the foreword of his book. Um, at the very beginning of his book, he talks about um, how important all of those things are. And he says, it's not just for running a marathon, it's also for how to find happiness in your life. So I'll just read the last paragraph of what he says here. He says, my secret to a long and healthy life has been taking care of my mind, body, and soul. Every day I challenge myself to think, exercise, eat healthy, and pray. I've really enjoyed my long life and hope you have a long and happy life too. I'd love for you to take care of yourself, try your hardest, and always choose yes when you meet a challenge. And who knows, maybe one day you can break my record for the oldest person to ever run a marathon. Nothing would make me happier. So that's Phil Jessing's message to you, the readers. Um, and what he's trying to say is that make sure that you do something good for your mind every day, right? Do your thinking, your homework, uh, learn something new every day, uh, exercise your body every day too, and make sure that your body is strong. And then the last thing he taught me was you always have to exercise your heart every day. And what he means by that is make sure that you're 
helping people around you and that will make you happier and it will also help you live longer. That's what I learned from Foyasin. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I keep telling my kids, you have to go out, exercise, take the fresh air in. And of course, I think kindness and just exercising your mind goes with it. Um, we have a very interesting question, Simran. Very good observation, Kiara, who is age 10. She asks, Simranjit Singh and Foja Singh. Why do you two have the same last name? Are you related? Good, great question. Um, I wish that I was related to Foja Singh because he's so cool and he's one of my heroes, uh, but I'm not related to him. I will tell you that the last name Singh is very, very popular where we come from. And I'll tell you why. Um, in, in the area where we come from of the world, in South Asia, in India, um, it used to be, and it still is largely true that your last name uh, tells people where you come from and, and in a lot of ways, how important your family is. And people would use that to say, well, these people are better or they're worse because of their, their, where their family comes from. And in our religion, in Sikhism, uh, our gurus taught us that everyone is equal, that no one is better and no one is worse. And so one of their ideas to help make sure that everyone lived that way was to say, you know what, if we're all in the same family, then maybe we should all have one last name, like we're in the same family, and that will make us feel more equal. So that's one of the things that we have in our culture. Uh, the last name Singh is for men. It means warrior or lion. Um, it means lion from, from Sanskrit. And it's also another interesting thing I'll tell you is that women have their own last name. So all the boys and men have the last name Singh, S-I-N-G-H. Um, and all the women, including the illustrator of the book, Baljinder Kaur, K-A-U-R, I'll show you a picture of her. Oh, I don't have it here, sorry. Um, K-A-U-R is the last name for girls and women. So my two daughters, whose picture I showed you, they have the last name Kaur, K-A-U-R. And that's also to say, well, uh, we're all equal, we're all part of the same family, but girls and women don't have to take the same last name as our other people, they can be independent too. Our next question, uh, Simran, is twofold. Um, it's by um, Komal, who's seven years old. She has um, asked, how many languages does Foja speak and how many languages do you speak? Uh, so that's the first question. And um, the second part of the question is, how did Foja Singh know that people were passing racist comments in London? Um, when he was running, when he doesn't understand English language? Mm, good questions. So Foja Singh does not speak English. He does not, he never learned it, even though he's lived in England now for mm, almost 40 years. He never learned English and he didn't have to because the people around him uh, understood the languages that he did know already. Um, he knows three languages, Punjabi, uh, English, oh, sorry, Punjabi, Hindi, and Urdu. Um, and those are also languages that I know. Um, and those are very common languages for people to know when they're from North India. And I will say that it's kind of interesting to me that for Singh, uh, he never got to go to school and study other languages, but just because of the way he was brought up, uh, he, he learned those languages very quickly. And so that's a really a uh, cool thing for him to already know three languages. Um, I also love languages. I, I love them always, even when I was a kid, but I especially started to love them when I got older and uh, started to study different cultures around the world, especially uh, around India. So that's what I did as my job uh, to study the history of India and different cultures there. Uh, and so part of my training, I studied 13 different languages. Um, and I don't remember all of them anymore, but I still remember a lot of them and, and work with them too. And then the second part of the question was, how did people know, uh, how did Foja know he, that people were passing racist comments uh, when he doesn't oh, understand question. English? Yeah, so one of the things, and, and I, you know, I've experienced this too, when you go to other cultures or countries and people are speaking different languages, 
you can tell still by their body language if they're being kind or if they're being mean. Uh, so you don't even need to know what they're saying all the time to know what, how they're feeling about you. So that's one thing. Foja could tell, just like I've been able to tell, if people were not being kind. Um, the other thing is um, when people call you things, um, whether it's good or bad, and you don't understand them, then you become really interested. And this has happened for me too. Uh, people have said nice things about me and not nice things about me when, when I didn't understand. Uh, but I just said, you know what, I, I'm really interested to know what they were saying. And so I, I'll go back and ask, even if it's in a different language, um, and I'll learn it. And then I, you know, I still hear it different times. And I remember, oh, this is what they were saying. So that's, that's how Foja knew uh, what people were saying. So there is a follow up question um, for that, um, which is submitted by Justin, who is nine years old. He's saying, um, he's asking, why did Foja not go to school? Can you explain that? That's a great question, Justin. This was a really uh, interesting thing for me to learn, actually. So if you'll remember at the beginning of the book, when Foy Singh was a child, his legs weren't actually strong enough for him to walk. And so this is what we call a disability. He wasn't able uh, to walk and play with the other kids. And because he lived so long ago, uh, when he was a kid so long ago, uh, before there were school buses, uh, and other ways for him to get to school, uh, he didn't get the privilege of going. And so he never got to go to school. He never got to learn to read or write. In fact, there's only one thing in the whole world he knows how to write. And I'll show that to you. We actually were pretty lucky because he put it in the book for us. And that's his signature. He wrote it in the Urdu script here, which you know, in English, we go left to right. In the Urdu script, you go right to left. So it says Foja Singh in Urdu. Um, that's the only thing he knows how to write. So, so I think about a couple of things um, when I think about him not getting to go to school. One is um, sometimes when you, when you see and learn that other people don't have the things that you have, it makes you feel thankful. Uh, you know, you, we have to remember that all of these things that we have are gifts. And so we can be thankful that we're so lucky to have the privilege of going to school and learning. And, and that helps us really enjoy life more. And the other thing I learn is when you think about there are people around the world and kids all over the world who don't get the privileges we do. Like there are a lot of kids who never get to go to school or learn how to read or write or anything. And so it makes me think about what can I do to help them? If I get to have some things that they don't, that doesn't really seem that fair. Maybe there's something that I can do uh, to make their lives better. Maybe, maybe there is a way that I can uh, get, you know, do a fundraiser to help get some donations so that they can pay for them to go to school. Or maybe they're not able to have books in their home and we can send some books if we have a lot of books in our house. You know, those are the kinds of things that I think about and, and I think about with my kids too. Great question. Thank you. Yep. And, th and there are some kids in different parts of the world um, that help their families, that work with their families on farms in the morning and then go to school in the evening. And they're so committed to making that happen. So you are completely right that it's a big privilege for us to go to school um, and really enjoy uh, learning. So another question from Dylan, who is seven years old, is... Did you enjoy writing the book, Simran? And will you be writing more books? Oh, good question, Dylan. I, I loved writing the book. Um, I'll tell you a couple reasons why. One is I usually write books uh, and articles for adults, and it's much more fun to write for kids. Uh, so that's one. As you probably can guess, Dylan, kids are a lot more fun than grownups. So it's more fun to write for kids. The second thing is, I love Foja Singh. He, I've always loved him ever since I learned about him. And because I was writing about him, it meant that I got to talk to him a lot. Um, I would show him the story because it's a biography. I, I really wanted him to be happy with uh, the way I was telling his life story. And so I would talk to him a lot and I really love having the chance to talk to him. I visited him a couple of times, uh, you know, after he came to New York, I went to London. So uh, yeah, that was a really special part of it. And I'll tell you, the, the, my other favorite part of it was 
Um, I, I, I like writing a lot. I like art too, but I'm not as good at it. And so I loved um, telling the story and then giving it to an artist and then seeing the illustration she made, you know, a few months later. And it just was so cool to me. It felt almost like magic that she was able to tell the story through the pictures. And so, um, yeah, that was a really cool experience for me too in writing this book. Um, other books, I'm writing some books for adults right now, but I have an idea for a book um, for kids that I'm working on. But as I mentioned before, it's really hard to get the right idea and you just have to keep practicing and editing and revising and, and making sure it's it's just right. So I'm, I'm working on it right now and hopefully it'll come out soon. Thank you. Another, book, uh, another question about your book is uh, from Vikas, who is 11 years old. He's asking, how long did it take you to write this book? And um, how many books have you written in your life? <laughs> Good question. Okay, so it took me to actually write the book. It took me about a year. Um, and that was because I was, I would write the story. Well, first I did some research. I needed to learn as much as I could about Floyd Jessing's life. Then I would, I would write it, I would share it with him, make sure he was happy with it, and we would go back and forth a few times. And then I would start showing it to other writers um, and my editor to make sure that they liked the story. And so it took, a, it took a, about a year to write the whole story. Um, then it took another about year or so for all of the illustrations to be finalized. Um, so that was about two years. And then it took another year for it to print uh, because they had to get all the the pages and the ink. I didn't even think that it would take that long. I was surprised to learn that, um, but it, it took a lot longer than I expected. So it did um, it did take me that long. And in terms of other books that I'm working on, that's a great question. Um, well, I've written aside from this one. I have one other book published. Uh, that's for. It's actually for journalists who are trying to cover religion, writing news about uh, the Sikh religion, especially. Um, and then I just finished another uh, book for adults. My, my final version is just about done um, and it should be, it's going to the printer now. So it should be ready in a year or so since that's how long it takes. But that book is trying to give grownups some advice on how do we live in, in a, difficult world uh, where things can be really hard and, and still for us to be uh, kind of like this so that we don't give up and we can find happiness. Those are the kinds of things that I think about I'm writing about. Thank you. Um, so uh, there is a question about the illustrations. Simran, you know, I love the illustrations in this book. I feel they're culturally very authentic and they have you know, small little elements that are almost like, um, you know, reliving nostalgia for me, the lizard on the wall, um, the, the map uh, of Punjab. So um, the question is, how did you, um, how did you communicate with the illustrator Baljinder Kaur? And how long, um, how many back and forths did you have in, um, in coming up with the illustrations and what was the process like? Good question. So, so in terms of back and forth, pretty much zero. Um, I loved everything that she did from the very beginning. And, you know, the kinds of things that you're describing, this is, this, I think it's because I had been a fan of her art for years before I had been following. And I know that she's, she, you know, she's also, she comes from a Punjabi Sikh family she lives in England, like Foja Singh. So she's able to capture both his life in Punjab and his life in England. Um, and also she has a real love for illustrating uh, elderly people. What in Punjabi we call bazurgs, which comes from Persian. It means the great ones, right? In our culture, we have a lot of respect for older people. And, and Baljinder Kaur, tries to bring that out in her art like she, she just loves that and so I knew when I wrote this book that I would I wanted her to do the illustrations um and as you know there there are so many things in here that only someone like her would have been able to do so I'll give you an example um 
this illustration to me was the first one that I saw. And I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what my every morning was like as a kid. I would sit exactly like this in front of my mom. She would use the same kind of wooden comb, which we call a ganga on my hair. That's what my hair looked like when I was a kid. Um, this kara is part of our the Sikh culture as well. So in the style of the, the mom's clothes is very similar to what my mom would wear. So it just felt really authentic. <coughs> Excuse me. But yeah, it just really felt authentic. And, and I felt that way all throughout the entire book. There was, there was only one uh, illustration that I even had feedback on. And I'll show it to you. Um, it was the, the image where Fo Justin gets on the airplane for the first time to go to England. And the reason that I had feedback on this illustration was, and, I, and I, I mentioned this once and my whole team understood what I meant. To me, it felt like a, a depiction of colonialism, that the, that the person at the top uh, would look like the European colonialist and, and the rest are sort of walking up and being welcomed onto the airplane. And so we had a good discussion around, well, how do we, how do we deal with these kinds of ideas and, and what's the best way to address them? But because my entire team was South Asian, my, my book agent is South Asian, my editor is South Asian, the illustrators, like we all understood uh, what the issues were and we were able to resolve them very quickly. So it was, it was really nice to have that kind of team together. So one question is about um, basically eating. What do you eat before running a marathon or before um, before you you know do any sport? I myself practice mindful oh. eating. I, I teach my children to eat mindfully, to eat nutritious food, and eat it when you know your body is asking for it. But can you tell us, Simran, from Foja's standpoint, um, what did he eat? Dal and roti is one thing that is in the book. Um, and then if you can also tell us, uh, since you run marathons, Simran, what, what do you eat right before the marathon or before a long run? Yeah, so, so Vodja Singh eats uh, more healthy than anyone I know, really. Um, he eats dal and roti at least once a day. Um, it's his favorite food. He actually asked me to make sure that I included it when I was, when I was talking to him. That's how much he loves it. And actually, last time I met him in England, um, we met at a Gurdwara, he was eating longer and his plate was just filled with dal and roti. So it's just kind of, I, I know that's what he loves and it's so healthy. Um, I also know that he doesn't eat sweets. Uh, he doesn't eat candy or cookies. Um, and he says, that's, that's not a healthy option. If you want something sweet, eat fruit. And so he loves fruit and he especially loves mangoes. And that's also why at the very beginning of the book, if you remember, uh, there's a, there's an illustration of him sitting under a tree eating mangoes. Um, so that's how Fo Jessing eats really healthy. You know, for me, I, uh, before a marathon, one of the, one of the things you're supposed to do is have a lot of, uh, carbs. So I eat a lot of pasta, a lot of bread. And then the morning of the race, I eat a, a couple of bagels. Um, and I do that because when you get all of those carbs in your body, that helps create energy. So when you're running, when you're running a marathon, you're running for sometimes four or five hours straight and you don't get to stop for a meal um, and your body starts running out of energy. And so then it can take the energy from all the bread and the pasta you've been eating. And then the other thing is when you're running a marathon, this is really interesting. Uh, I didn't know it until I started running. Uh, one of the other ways to get energy while you're running is to eat sugar. And so uh, that's the quickest way to get energy. And so um, sometimes when I run a marathon, uh, I'll have some candy with me like gummy bears or Twizzlers and I'll just eat those while I'm running. And it's a nice distraction, uh, but it also gives me a little energy when I'm feeling really tired. So with that, we will wrap up our session. Uh, thank you so much, Simran. This was absolutely amazing. Just hearing the story, learning more about Foja and all the different things that we learned from this book. Thank you to the audience for submitting these great questions. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Neelam from Asia Society. Thank you. Thank you, Simran, that was wonderful. Your perspective and passion about culture, kindness, and religion bring your story to life, and we really appreciate that. Here at the Center for Global Education, our goal is to introduce children to stories that will help them to investigate the world, recognize perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. 
You and your important book embody these qualities and thank you very much. And we look forward to reading more from you soon. And for our audience, we thank you for joining us for our first of many Own Voices virtual readings. Please join us on the last Saturday of each month where we will feature a new author and a new book. You may check back on our website for upcoming events at www.asiasociety.org education. And once again, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.